So we will have a set of series of records in the first time. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Creative Spark. We're going to get started in one minute as we just figure out some technical issues, but um, please stay with us. Perfect. Thank you. And Conrad, can I see your pretty face? I can't turn my video on. I don't know what's going on. Oh, all right. Well, let me get started while we work this out. We are happy to have this show in honor of uh, Mental Health Awareness Month. And for this episode, we're gonna be delving into mental health. 
And we've got two visual artists with us who we've seen around the city lately. And um, it's Nazir Sabri and Yannick Lowry. And both of them have been working through their experiences on mental health and their art practices. So we're very happy to have the both of you here and to speak more about what you do. Hi guys. Hey, hey. How's everybody? I'm good. I, we're gonna, gonna get the man of the hour in a second. Hello. I've never had that before. I just kept saying unable to start video. Hi everyone, welcome to the Crave Spark. We're, we're here. <laughs> Nobody wanted to see you tonight. So we, you know, intentionally just kept your camera off. Well, and what a perfect month for this to happen, a mental health conversation. You know, not everything's gonna happen the way you expect it to happen or the way you hope it happens. And you just gotta go with the flow. But I'm really excited for tonight's conversation. Uh, we wanna mention that unfortunately, Yannick won't be able to stay with us for the entire hour. Um, he is so busy, he's so double booked, he's so wanted in the city, but we're happy for the time that we do have him. So what I'm gonna suggest is that if anyone wants to ask Yannick questions while we're talking, because he'll only be with us until about, we hope to push it into like 6, 10 maybe, you can put your questions in the chat box or use the Q&A and we'll keep an eye on it and ask him periodically. And one thing Ginger and I always love to do is, you know, we could read your bios off of a script, but we love to hear your own description of your career and yourself. So maybe we start with Nazir and then go to Yannick. Just introduce yourself to the crowd and those watching later on YouTube. Who are you? What do you do? In a few sentences. Okay. Um, so I'm Nazir Sabri. Um, I am a visual artist. I'm from West Philly, um, but I also grew up in North Philly, so I claim both. I was back and forth growing up, um, but I'm a, I, I, I paint. I do a lot of paintings, portraits, and also using collage in my work, but I'm really talking about Blackness in my work, talking about mental health, talking about my experience and the collective experience here in Philadelphia, um, and just having a, a raw conversation through my work. Uh, the conversation that I'm seeing is not really uh, being had or didn't I didn't hear growing up. Um, and I'm doing that in my work. So yeah, that's, that's me. Hi everyone, my name is John Lowry. Uh, I'm an interdisciplinary artist based here in Philadelphia. I'm originally from New York City, but I've been here for about four years now. Um, I primarily work in collage and uh, I have a few things that are reoccurring, but lately, it's been one of Black Paradise and remembering moments of that experience and imagining future paradises for Black folks. So, I mean, the use of collage has really just enabled me to create these kind of surreal worlds where we live abundantly. And, um, you know, I think that is expanded throughout my practice and I hope to continue that until it's realized. Ginger, you're on mute. Thank you, because we haven't been using Zoom for forever now. Um, one of the questions that I wanted to ask Yannick, for people who may not be familiar with your work, is can you tell us a bit about the imagery that we see on a sort of like a consistent basis, this theme that you've been playing out for a while in that work? Yeah, I mean, so a lot of the imagery, it starts from really text. I mean, I'm a big reader, and I think a lot of uh, my work is really almost an iteration of things that I've read and kind of absorbed through my own experience. So it, it starts with a, an image that starts in my head and, and I'm seeking a resemblance of that image through archive papers uh, and images that I find in magazines or pretty much anywhere. Um, but I do like to source a lot of my stuff from the historical documents, um, but I also use contemporary imagery in a way that hopefully can parallel you know, both of those periods. Um, in my mind, I'm thinking about using images that can act as timestamps, ones that you can understand the placement in consideration and comparison to, you know, where you are and where you'd like to be. And I think collage really allows me to do that in a unique way that I haven't seen before and I, I'd like to continue doing. I hope that answers that. I think uh, it's, it's an open-ended question, but I think one of the sources just for finding imagery is always motivated just by text. It always starts there. It's like something that 
we talked about like in the very beginning, how I had never seen a lot of black collage, which then I've, after I found you, I found like tons of societies of <laughs> artists who come together and yeah. do this, but it makes me wonder why we don't see it maybe uh, in, in like media very often. I mean, I feel like there's a very easy answer to that, but I figured <laughs> <laughs> let me throw that to you. Why, you know, it's it we've been using it a lot in campaigns that you've been doing with us because we recognize the fact that it seems very absent in the art world. But I figured, you know, why why is that, Yannick? Well, I mean, there's several reasons, but I think um, well, first let me say there is a, a huge history of black collage artists. Um, in this country and globally. Um, this is not a new kind of thing, but I think what's, what's interesting is the uh, exposure that it's getting now. And I think that just you know, parallels what's just happening on a societal level, like people are starting to see us. So I think that reflects in the work also. Um, and then think in, in this medium specifically, it's just something, like I said, is, is paralleling and reflecting what's actually happening. And that's the great thing I think about this medium is that it's so, it has an urgency about it. You know, it has a, like I said, a timestamp. So you understand like looking at this image, maybe what year was taken, you know, or what, you know, kind of a milieu comes along with it because of, you know, your time and your place in the world. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a bunch of other reasons I won't get into. Some of them are a bit spicier, but I'm just glad that the moment is happening now and that I'm here and that there's more of us. I mean, there's no shortage, you know, we're abundant. I'll say anybody wants to leave a spicy answer to that, put it in the, uh, the chat, <laughs> they will read it. <laughs> Why aren't there more, more black collapses? <laughs> yeah. Yannick, when we were at your exhibition, um, the Ginger curated at the Fiddler Club, we, I asked you about Tumblr, because I think that that's the first place I really came across the kind of collage work that you do was, I want to say like in the early 2010s, it was really, you saw it a lot more on Tumblr and that was really the first place I saw it. And, you know, I work in social media. That's sort of like where I live and breathe every single day. So can you talk about your relationship with that early social media platform, Tumblr, how it influenced you, how you used it, and um, yeah, how do you view using social media to this day to present your artwork or to be inspired to create your artwork? Great question. First of all, Tumblr, shout out to Tumblr because that's where I really got it kind of going. I started posting on Tumblr like in college as just um, a space to like a baby step for sharing my work, but not sharing it. Like a lot of the work was just like, you know, so I could say that it's online, it exists if someone asked me about it. But I wasn't really at a place where I felt completely comfortable sharing that. So Tumblr was kind of like a, an inclusive kind of network where I could, you know, play around with people's responses to the work, which now ironically is something that I try to ignore as much as possible, um, especially with the, you know, use or overuse of Instagram. Um, and I share my work there regularly, but it, it's become a place where I really just try to share the work without the viewer in mind, you know, like really just coming from a place of sincerity and then seeing what happens is kind of just like a bonus, you know, and, and I don't, I don't move dependent on that, you know, so I think um, if it wasn't for Tumblr, I wouldn't be so kind of jaded by, you know, people's responses and that kind of instant gratification um, that I think a lot of people are, are suffering through by using Instagram or especially creatives using Instagram because it's so dependent on that kind of instant, you know, validation or just even acknowledgement, you know. I, I, I've come to a point where I'm confident enough in my work and the journey that my work is going on that I can just share it without that. You know, um, but Tumblr was great at the time. Whatever happened to Tumblr? Is anybody still on Tumblr? <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I was a bad landlord and I left tons of tenants just over at Tumblr. Oh, yeah. I went off and did other things. Um, but maybe you're going to make me look at it tonight. I'm like, I just, you know. You should. You should check your messages. You might have some, you know, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but since we're going to lose you soon, um, like boo hoo, but how about the? You told us about the project you're doing now in Philadelphia, the Black Paradise Project, because this one has been, this one has been huge for you. Um, 
and you're working with mural arts to do it and a clinician. So I'm gonna let you go into how complicated and fun this project seems. Yeah, I mean, I can talk about their project forever, but I do wanna like just touch on the theme of this call and like tie that into how this kind of works into the project and to my practice. Um, I've, it's, to me, this country just really has a really short memory. You know, it wasn't too long ago that it was still in question whether or not Black people could feel pain or have the capacity to experience love or joy or any just simple human, you know, emotion. So I think remnants of those beliefs still linger, you know, possibly just in our subconscious. So for so long, we've just really been trying to prove that our lives are worth living and that we deserve to live and that Black lives actually matter. Like the fact that that phrase kind of stuck as a thing. I mean, it's just, you know, reflective of a bigger issue um, that, you know, beyond our strength, beyond our grace, beyond our style and flavor and influence, you know, our cool and all of these external gifts um, live something really intimate and really internal. Um, and I think that's our mental state, you know, that's our mental well-being. And it's not for performance, you know, it's not in spite of it's not about resilience, you know, it's not about, um, you know, it's not in response to something else. It's really just a personal kind of experience that I think this project really wanted to highlight, um, you know, really a conscious reflection of our experience and our radically looking forward and towards the future, you know, and the prosperity of ourselves and our collective people. So with a project like this, and, you know, what we tried to do is really create spaces for Black folks to actively seek joy as a remedy for the experience of being Black in America. I mean, just that, like that idea of reframing racism as something that requires treatment, and then that treatment being something as simple as, you know, going on a, on a trail in the Wissahickon, you know what I mean? Like we, we've tried to really create spaces where people can tap into what's really going on. Um, I think every Black person in this country, and I hate to speak generally like that, but whether the conscious of it or not conscious of it has been affected by racism in some shape or form. And I think that's just the nature of this country. And people are really finally starting to remember, you know, that it doesn't have to be that way. And I think um, this project really just aims to mitigate, like I said, that impact um, by creating these spaces. So we partner with some really incredible black organizations here in Philadelphia um, and just all across the country, but we're based in Philly. Uh, outdoor Afro, we did like a guided walking tour with them in the Wissahickon, and we did like a watercolor activity that was amazing. We've done yoga sittings and meditation sittings. Um, we did an awesome tea and tincture workshop with Krista Barfield. Um, we've done roller skating events, we've done garden cleanups. Right now we're working on a really incredible anthology with submissions from incredible writers and artists around the city um, that'll be published shortly this summer. Big picture, all of these events have been photographed and I'll be using these photographs to create a composition that will be turned into a mural uh, this summer, hopefully this July. So it's like, this project so closely mirrors my own practice just because, I'm sorry, I'm gonna lobby people to just chat my desk. Um, yeah, it, it reflects so 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 closely my practice, and it's really a pleasure to be working on this. Uh, I was partnered with a clinical psychologist, as you mentioned, Kimberly Ashby. She's been instrumental in just putting this together and developing the ideas behind this. Um, please check out the website, blackparadiseproject.com. We've also got an Instagram, same name. Um, yeah, really quick plug. This Saturday, we're having a garden restoration at Lillian Marrero Library. Um, we're gonna be there for the next two weekends. Please join us, we're looking for volunteers. I know I'm taking up a lot of time, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, we know you're gonna have to go soon, so we appreciate you, you know, like being the one to like talk first, but I've also put the link to the Black Paradise Project in our chat. Oh, perfect. If anybody yeah. wants to check out their mission statement, what have been going on the city. But then get over to Nazir to talk about some of his practices and how mental health, uh, the narrative of that does sort of come up in your work from time to time. Oh, yeah. Um, you want me to jump right into it? Yes, please do. Yeah. Uh, well, I think um, 
for me, it's kind of more so like an, an outlet. Like, I don't know if you've ever felt that, you know, the feeling of holding in a secret. Like, I'm not supposed to be saying something. And like, you run and you tell your best friend and you tell somebody, I kind of felt like that with my practice. Going through so much stuff here in Philly, uh, my paintings have been the thing to really let that out. Uh, seeing a lot of stuff and, you know, talking about the PTSD and the violence that goes on here in some of the, the communities that I've been in, um, in my work and to see the, the response of it has been surreal. I was not, never expecting any of this. It just was like a, I, I, I have to say something moment in my life, um, talking about the depression, talking about the anxiety, talking about stuff that I didn't even really notice that I had until like I looked myself in the mirror. Like I remember, um, noticing like the first moment that I noticed like oh I, it's some type of PTSD like going on um and putting it in my work so so yeah it's been like an extreme outlet for me and did you how did you come to art did you go to school for art or how did you land here um so I always was, I was doing art my whole life but I did go to a couple of schools for art so I've been to nine schools in total throughout my whole like academic career life thing um but growing up my dad was an artist uh so I would always like steal his old sketchbooks and like try to mimic his uh comic book sketches um and also um I would look at a lot of his comic books so my dad used to collect a lot of like Marvel and DC comics so I grew up tracing out of those uh, comic books but also meeting certain people in the community um I remember I had these two neighbors uh I think his, his name was Mr. Bill was a white guy in our neighborhood and like he really uh seen my um my hunger for art at a young age he was the first person to ever sit me down and let me do a a still life drawing I didn't even know what that was at the time but he was the first person that let me do that and um just growing up going to different schools I remember going to Dobbins and studying fashion design for a moment and then leaving there and going to Chad. Chad no longer exists, but it was this high school uh, named Charter School for Architecture and Design. That's where I ended up graduating from. But I went there for architecture and design, but also kind of like graphic design. Um, but the whole time while I was doing like those uh, type of heavy subject based uh, activities, I was going back home and like painting in my bedroom, um, like as a therapeutic thing uh, without even noticing it. So. So yeah, I've always been drawn. I've always been an artist. I think it really clicked for me and it was like, oh, I want to do this for the rest of my life. Um, right, be right before I dropped out of college, I met this uh, guy named Randy Chavez who became one of my mentors. And like he, whenever I tell the story and I break it down, I say he is the Gus the model to my Mike Tyson. Um, he kind of really made me feel confident in my work because at some point I, I, was, I was not confident in what I'm doing, what, what I am doing now. Um, and I just felt like, what was the point of it? I remember telling Ginger, I was like, the only time I seen people that make money off of art, they was dead. So I didn't even know you can make money off of this or really do it for real, for real. Um, and also, Randy was the first person to show me Black artists, honestly. Like outside of the, po the popular names like Basquiat and all those guys, he showed me Black illustrators and he showed me illustrators from Philly. Um, so I was super, super inspired by that. And he was like, you know, uh, because during college, my, uh, my uh, major was illustration and painting. Um, and he was just like, you know, illustrators were the first rock stars. And like, he built this whole narrative behind it. And I was like, oh yeah, like, I'm, I'm going for it. Like, I'm gonna go all the way. So he really, really inspired me. And like, it just clicked, like when I met him. So, yeah. I think that's really interesting because the series that you have now that's up at Paradigm and then the other one at Fittler is called False Face. Mm -hmm. And, you know, swirling this, this mask that you give these young black kids is of all of sort of like pop culture moments, but also social and political movements that have affected all of us, quite frankly. Um, but you're talking about specifically what it does to young black men. Um, yeah. how that changes them. So I, I think it's been a very strong series for people, but can you talk to us a bit about like how it was for you mentally to even like put that on canvas? Um, honestly, it was, it was very tough. It was really grimy, 
It was very ugly. It was very hard because it took a lot to, of like me looking inside myself. Uh, I think in the beginning of me doing art, I was painting for validation. I was painting to be accepted and like um, using my gifts to get into certain groups, certain conversations, to be cool, all these things. Um, and at some point I hit a wall where I couldn't do that no more. Like a lot of people were just like, yeah, we know that you paint and you're very good at it, but we don't hear what you're saying. And I was like, what you mean? How oh, you can't hear what I'm saying? Like, look at me, I'm nice. Look what I'm doing. Like all this extra stuff, all this ego. Um, and I really had to sit with myself and really say, what am I doing with my work? How is my work really uh, affecting people? Is it making people uncomfortable? Is it actually making people inspired? Is it doing anything other than looking pretty? Where that's okay too, but I was already doing that. So I had to sit down with myself and really ask myself and, and really like uh, face myself in the mirror about my experience. Um, talk about parts of my life that I was disassociating from because I didn't want to go back here. Uh, a lot of the times I was scared because I didn't want to go back and be in, like uh, being depressed. Uh, I used to be very, very depressed growing up. Um, I think when I went to California, I had this whole culture shock that I ended up, I ended up going through this whole episode of like really being, really being super, super depressed before I went to go seek counseling. But like I wouldn't eat. I was like 120 pounds. I started to shave my head. Like I was really going through a lot of stuff. And I was scared to look myself in the mirror and like ask myself, well, why was that happening to me? Like the real question is like, why? Why did I feel that? Why did some of those things growing up I disassociated from? Who did I have to be in some of these situations growing up? All of these things. Um, and I didn't go back into being depressed. I actually kind of like got a little, got answers to certain stuff, but it was very, it was very grimy. It was not cute. I know a lot of people, like the stuff that I post on Instagram or when I'm doing it, it looks super cool, but it was very, very grimy. And even doing the history, like uh, I read a lot of different books uh, to like help with my work even going back to certain parts of history, that part was grimy as well. As a black man, seeing some of the stuff in history, this was grimy and then seeing it happen, rehappening again today, and then feeling this sense of like helplessness, like how do I, how do I try to stop this? How do I say something in this moment while I got a chance? I don't wanna look back and like have my kids ask me in these moments, what did I do or where was I at in these moments? Um, and not have an answer for them. I, I wanted to participate in the conversation of what was going on. So this is like me doing it, me okay. calling out. Before, before Yannick goes, I want you both to answer this question if you can. Do you think that what you're doing as young black men, talking about something that we barely talk about in the black community, but doing it as black men who are told perhaps that it's not okay to cry, it's not okay to have these types of emotions. Do you think your work is helping other men and have you have instances where they actually feel comfortable enough to tell you they can open up because of the work you're doing? Yannick, I'll, I'll let you go first, and I'll go after you. Um, that's a good question. It, it, it's funny, because I think that certain things, creative aspects like writing and art, visual art, dance, for some reason have been feminized in general in a way that I, I never really understood. I, I also come from a family of artists, and, I, and, I, and I've noticed that it's um, it seems like... Um, the people that respond most to the work, or at least that are vocal about it, have been women towards me, for that, in my experience. Uh, I'm not sure if men are not voicing it or just not feeling it in the same way, but for me, it's not about that. And, 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 you know what I mean? Like, it really starts with me, selfishly. <laughs> I, I'll say that unapolog unapologetically. I think it starts with myself and a lot of these themes that in my work Develop just from doing that work. And I'm hoping that people can, you know, relate to that, it, you know, and they don't have to tell me about it. You know, that can be a private, intimate thing that they can, you know, keep to themselves. I think um, specifically the work that I'm doing now really developed during isolation, you know, during the pandemic, where I was just doing and writing journals and really thinking about what made me happiest and what made me respond to certain things. Um, and I think that starts just from like you said, as you're looking within, like really doing, like looking 
at yourself from the outside and from the inside out. And then, you know, working from that place. So of course I would, it'd be nice if people, you know, were impacted by the work and could grow some in a way, you know, or even just start a practice, you know, by inspired by something that I'm doing, but that isn't always the goal. Yeah, and I'll piggyback off of that. Um, that's crazy because like I said, this series just started with me like challenging myself. So I, I, I definitely walked in with the same thing. Like, this is for me, regardless of who likes it, regardless of all the approval and acceptance, all of that stuff. Like, this is for me. I got to I gotta do this for me. I did it for everybody else. Now I'm doing it for me. Um, but like I said, I am surprised that a lot of people have approached the work and, like, feel like they see themselves and, like, are very, very vocal about it. And it still feels, I, I don't want to say weird, but I'm going to say weird, like, uh, Cause I was not expecting that. Like um, even like having certain friends come in the studio while I was working on it and like see it and be like, like, bro, I, when I go into museums, it's cool and all, but I don't really feel or see myself. And when I'm seeing this work, I, I feel this, like it's touching on the core or have kids who not from Philly uh, say stuff about the work. Like um, I had a, a person that I went to college with reach out and she's a teacher and she said that, you know, some of her students seen the work and are like, you know, Miss G, that's how I feel. Like it's something about that work that is touching on a lot of different things for a lot of people that I was not expecting. So, yeah, it's weird. Really, I'm sorry, I was gonna say before I go, yeah, people seeing, people need to see themselves in the work and I think when they when they feel seen and they feel recognized and understood, you know that that adds to that gives them something that you know is intangible. That's what art is about, right? I mean, it's, it's about well, theoretically, it's about making people feel something without saying something. You know, it's like those um, intangible things that just are understood. And I think um, by creating work that has us included in it. I think that can only just add to the full spectrum and understanding of, of what we're doing um, and of ourselves at the same time. It's, it's like, you know, one hand is washing the other. It's really a cyclical kind of process for me. And I think a, a lot of others artists feel that way. But that's I okay. do have to go. I'm sorry. Uh, that's okay. That's okay. We'll just keep talking about you in your absence. <laughs> okay. I apologize. Can I ask you one quick question before you go? It's super easy. This yeah. is the first Creative Spark where people have mentioned reading a bunch of times. What book are you reading right now? Oh, right now I just finished this book called The Prophets by, uh, what's his name? Ah, uh, I'm blanking on his name, but it's called The Prophets. It, it's a huge book. It's incredible. It's about- um, Fiction, nonfiction? It's fiction. Okay. But it's actually- you know, it's got a bit of both in it, actually. It's playing with ideas of, of slavery and um, sexuality, and it's 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 wild. Let me just look it up really, really quick. Wait, is this the one by Robert Jones? That's the one. Okay, I'll put a link to it. Yeah, please check that out, everybody. It's amazing. Awesome. Is that? Mean, sorry. Does this mean you have to leave now, or are you sick? Yeah, I don't like being late. Believe it or not, I hate being late to, to stuff. I gotta go, y'all. We I'm were late to talking everything. about the project. <laughs> in your apps. He is. He is. Okay. <laughs> Please. Yeah. It was so great to have you. Thank you, Yana. Nazir, Thank you all for having me. Nazir, what are you reading? You mentioned um, reading. So, I I'll be reading a couple different books at one time because I be I don't I read to like study so I can use it for my work, but. Um, there is a book that I do have that I, I'm reading here and there, and it's 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 interesting. Um, it's called White Man's Law. I can't remember the author, but yeah, it's pretty pretty you know straightforward. It's uh, nonfiction and it's touching on some social issues. So I will see if I can't find that too. Um, but I think the thing that I was going to say before Yannick jumped off, which what was really interesting about what he's saying is that the project was a perfect space for him to create what he called um, experiences for Black people to seek relief through self-care. Um, and so, you know, I, I kind of like that instead of like, I'm here to help you with your mental health, right? It just made me 
they're like, oh, I, I, I should treat myself to this. That sounds like something I should luxuriate in. Like, relief is oh. care. I'll say to you, Ginger, you know, we talk a lot about like the murals of mural arts, Philadelphia, and a lot of them are collage you know, especially the ones created in the 80s and 90s, very collage very like staff artists created. Um, and, but, and which isn't, you know, not adding a, a value judgment, Jared, just saying there's like a very specific style. So I'm really interested to see Yannick's like modern, his take on that sort of collage style for a mural. I think it's going to look really interesting and surreal and it's if he's taking photos of what's happening in philly this summer people will be able to see themselves in it too i'm really excited to see his mural yeah yeah same here hopefully i'm hoping that happens um but that's the other thing so even with your work nazir i think what has been really interesting is finding out that not only have you been working on your mental health issues while making this work right leaving that imprint on the work but also you've been learning as you go along. And so what I love about that work is like, you've been educating yourself on like how to be better. Why am I stuck in the sort of like the mire that I am right now? Or, or could that have been, because like this book that I'm typing in for everybody, like this is white men's laws of roots of like um, systemic racism. So it's like, this is a crazy thing to put yourself through for art um, that is having all of these, I think, benefits for people. I saw someone last night standing in front of a piece in Fittler and he's just like, I knew that was me the moment I saw it. You know, yeah, and I think it's like, you know, you've got this mask and the thing that sort of like beams out from all of these like atrocities or pop culture moments that we've been a part of um, was the eyes, right? So it's like, you're being fed that, he's living through it, but he's still looking out at the other person. And I, I wonder if that's not the first step to like, this mental health healing is that we can all try and identify with one another, even if we can't understand what we're going through um, and provide solutions without judgment. Yeah, um, I can't remember the artist, but they came and did this artist talk. Um, and if, if I find it, hopefully I can email it to y'all, but she was talking about empathy and like empathizing with people and, and like empathy versus sympathy, right? Where somebody can sympathize with you and say, oh, well, that's bad. At least it ain't happened to me. Where empathy is like you put yourself in that position and you think about it and you could be like, you know, dang, I, I can understand how that hurts. And um, I think maybe that's something that's happened with the work. A moment of empathy is happening and like people could relate to it. Like, because that's not the first time I heard somebody say that too. Like when I've seen this, I immediately saw myself, which is it's still just crazy to me. Like, uh, I know work is powerful, but sometimes, like, also, you know, the moment in history where somebody's becoming something or something is becoming a moment that we're feeling. Uh, just thinking about that, like, uh, that fear, that that moment. I remember creating this work and feeling fear of like, uh, this work don't look like my regular body of work and stuff that I used to work, make in the past, like being uncomfortable, and that fear. But I didn't know that that feeling in my stomach would be that moment that I'm changing my life, I'm changing my art. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's it's just a crazy experience. Like, it's a lot. It's a lot, and, 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 and as an artist, who I, I don't feel like I've ever done this before, like had a body of work this meaningful. Um, I've had stuff, like I said, it's been cute. Like it's been, I know what I'm doing far as stylistically, but going back and doing all the history, looking inside myself uh, and really critiquing what's been going on around me. I, I, this is my first time. And um, it, is, it is wild to see the reception behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was trying to look up this, um, this tweet that someone had left like at the beginning of the month and seeing as how it's like Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, but he's just like, oh, if everybody needs therapy, then the problem is everyone is dealing with something that's systemic, something that's cultural and too big to be confronted alone between two people. It's actually a grave injustice to make individuals responsible for this. And I'm like, what a way to start the month. You know, it's just yeah. like, you know, I think at this point, especially with the pandemic, like we all, we all have things to work on, but it's, it's pretty obvious that we haven't been talking about it, right? Um, yeah. When we hear people talking about it, you have to start to accept the fact that it's not just you. 
like it's other people, but it's making me question the interactions that I have with people. Whereas previously mm-hmm. I might have been, you know, just written it off as them being like nasty or, you know, aggressive and rude. But it's like, if I am going through something today, like where is the point that I stop and wonder if the person that I just had that interaction with, like, what are they going through? And do I reach out yeah. to them if it's unusual or it's, you know, you know, like a typical, like an ask if they're okay. Yeah, it's, it's a tricky thing. Like, because you don't want to, write everything off right and that's where we come from like culture of writing that off but also sometimes I think being too touchy don't work either but I think it's a healthy balance uh it's this book it's another book uh that you guys could check out in the comments and everything it's called the four agreements um I remember reading the four agreements in that first chapter and it's like don't take anything personal right and it kind of in that moment a lot of stuff that I was taking personally and looking at certain, looking at certain things and feeling like I was being judged or somebody's attacking me, like kind of, I kind of felt the breath of fresh air, like, oh, that's what that was. And a perfect example for that is, and I know we all have heard it, like people who work in customer service, you get a customer that walk in and they're smart, they're being nasty. And it's like, man, that person, that's something that they got going on. I'm not going to take that home with me. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But what if, what if it's somebody close to you, right? Interactions. Um, when that person, it seems like it's something irregular. Like, how do you address that, right? And I think that's where empathy comes in as well, but also not taking things super duper personal sometimes at the same time, having that balance. So yeah, it's a, it's a lot. It's a, it's a lot <laughs> around that. And I think we all got to, like, I think we all should be checking in with ourselves. Like, how do I feel? Yeah. Do you, I'll, this is a point too, we have about 15 minutes left. If you are watching live, a lot of people watch this on YouTube after the fact, but if you're watching live and you have questions, now's the time to start typing it into the chat and we'll uh, ask those as we end in the next 15 minutes or so. But Nazir, you mentioned earlier how quickly your sort of career has taken off. Uh, you have a show at Paradigm, uh, you know, it, it seems like you're doing a lot of stuff. So I'm wondering, since this conversation is around mental health, how is that, it, it's challenging being in this world period, let alone being a busy artist. People want a lot from you. This work, you, the work you're doing is so mentally, spiritually, physically exhausting. How are you managing the success, wanting to run at the train while it's at the station or whatever expression would be, um, but also making sure that you're taking care of yourself? What's that process like? Um, you know, that's something I'm actively doing. Like that's even great. now, even before I got on this call, like uh, I think taking it one day at a time because it's not, it's kind, it's it's very like, it's very weird. It's like those stories we hear about certain people um, that are on that way up. And it's like, oh, well, at the time, I didn't know they was also going through this thing. I thought that that was so far removed from them. It's certain things that I'm not yet far removed from that you would think that I should be. And like still trying to balance these things and stay out of certain situations and and out of the way. And um, just trying to stay level-headed behind certain things. There's certain conversations that you wouldn't think I would have to have. Um, or certain people, uh, in a, in a way that they're voluming me as an artist and uh, devaluing me at the same time. It's very, it's a weird thing that I'm taking one day at a time. And um, I'm also calling on my community for help in moments where it's like something don't seem right about this. Let me not just run with it and be big headed. Let me call somebody who I trust, um, Ginger. Um, <laughs> but just, you know, taking it one day at a time. And also I will say this, um, it's something that I pray for. It's something that I worked hard for um, because, you know, some people are just meeting me now, but for the people who do know, I've been, I've really been consistent with making work and making art since 14 um, up until this now, up to this point, and I'm 24. So it's like, it's been so long and I've, and I've sacrificed so much to be here, going to college, then figuring out that, oh, this program isn't for me, I'm dropping out. And doing all of this stuff um, just to get here. So it's like, I'm appreciative because this is what I asked for and what I worked for. But at the same time, it is a lot of pressure. It is a lot of different stuff that a lot of people don't see sometimes that I'm going through and um, that I'm learning at the same time, learning through. 
uh, then I'm taking one day at a time and not trying to let stuff go to my head or get super anxious about certain stuff, just taking it one day at a time and being smart about stuff, talk, like thinking through through issues and stuff. So yeah, that was a lot. But No, 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 yeah. we're here for a lot. I mean, the mental health chat is a lot, you know? But we do have a question in the Q&A box. Um, so someone, it's, it has a couple of parts. So I like this, we can go through it. Um, did you study art in college? Uh, and if so, what was your experience like there? And if you didn't, do you think about the nuances in the academia? Um, so I did study art in college, um, but my experience was very, uh, it, it wasn't the best experience. There was a lot of stuff going on on campus that was getting in the way of uh, me staying focused, which is crazy, though, because I was on the dean's list academically. I was uh, I was doing the best I ever did in my academic life in college, but it was because I felt like I had to prove a point. Um, so here here's a little story in that. So before I got accepted to college, my average was a D average. I really got the college off of my art portfolio. So them seeing my work alone, they took a risk on me and saying like, oh, this kid is talented. Let's see what happened up there. But it was like they were watching me like very, very closely. So I was striving through that. I was uh, having tr trouble with uh, my art history class. I had never studied before. So I had to teach myself how to study on this campus while I'm going through all these little racial incidents. That's a whole nother thing because we was a small population of Black people on that campus. Um, but also uh, it it was like a, you know how in the military they strip you and then they re rebuild you back up? They was doing the same thing with me as an artist. I was so used to just do like, you know, going and thriving off of just pure talent and riding that wave of being talented, that talented artist in the classroom. They sat me down, they took all it away and they taught me the academics and all these different, uh, different terms and stuff. And uh, I had this one teacher named Casey Rosenberg and I was very, very hard on myself in the beginning. It was a uh, drawing, a figure drawing class one-on-one. -on -one. I had never drew a new person in my life, but she was the person that was just like, yo, look at your work in the beginning of this class. And now we're at the end of it. You made so much progress. You got to stop being so hard on yourself. Um, but after meeting those people, uh, that semester, the next semester, like I said, I met Randy, everything kind of started to click. So my talent met the academia that I was learning from them. Um, and it just, it took off. But it was certain stuff that I didn't pay attention to that I, I'm doing now, I'm studying now. Like art history, when I was in school, I was just trying to get a good grade. I really wasn't trying to hear what they was talking about. So, so it's stuff like that that's now, like it's, it's coming back. And I, I, I do think some of the stuff that they're teaching on those campuses are important, um, but I don't think that the way that they teach them are effective, if that makes sense. Um, I think, even in my work, like like how you pointed out, Ginger, it's a lot of stuff that I'm teaching myself and I'm studying on that's coming through my work that you would think I had knew that already for a long time, where it's like, no, nah, it's just clicking now. I found I found my own curriculum. I made my own curriculum. So yeah, I that answers like different. mental art for artists, right? It's like mental health <laughs> for for artists because I've had the people like saying things in the chat room, and I think that sometimes we just think about it as having to be everything that's sort of like pervasive and swirling around us now. But this is interesting to hear how that affects you on campus, how that affects you in your art practices, right? And what you have to go through to find yourself through this art process, which is something that, you know, not all of us have the, I think that we don't have that sort of introspection. It's very, it's very nuanced for lack of better words. Yeah. Any artists I've ever talked to, I can't imagine that, right? If you're going to art, if you're going to school to study this, that, or the other thing, like the law, for example, right? You're studying a science in a way, right? Where when we're in the arts, like you're going and you have to expose yourself, you have to dive into yourself, you have to do things that a lot of other students are don't have to do. So it's a lot of work, period. And then it's a lot of introspection and criticism. Yep. Being 21, you know, being 19, 20, 21 and getting like feedback in like really critical ways, I can't imagine um but oh i was gonna i was wondering as you were talking like you know artists careers have different eras in them do you ever see in your future based off of your experience in school wanting to be a lecturer wanting to be a teacher or going to school in some way or in an admin position consulting position? i i would love that uh, 
and well, yeah, even further, whenever it presents itself, right? Because even now, like during some of the teachings that I'm doing now, like around the city um, with certain locations, um, I'm learning a lot of materials that even those professors that I had didn't understand why certain artists were in the art world or why certain work meant it. Like they just didn't get it. And it's something that I'm getting right now that's like, it sometimes feel otherworldly. And I don't mean that in the ego sense, it's just, I'm, I'm really studying a lot of stuff. Like um, the time where I should be out having a good time as a young person, all that stuff, um, I'm breaking down why Pablo Picasso's Carnica is the way it is. I'm doing stuff like that. Like I'm really getting in a, in a bag in a different swing and also work outside of uh, different mediums. Like I feel like music is the same thing. Like uh, when I was creating this body of work, one of the things that I was saying is I want to create a body of work that feels like uh, Marvin Gaye's What's Going On To Me and how that album is so powerful during that time when it came out. And it's something that I wasn't around when that stuff was going on, but it's something that it hits my heart. It hits my spirit. How can I make work that translate in that same way? So I feel like I'm understanding the doing that now. So in the near future, if that opportunity presents itself, yes, I I, I would love to do that. Um, I think a lot of information in the art world is very, very gatekeep. And like, I don't want to be a part of that uh, gatekeeping process. So yeah, I would love to do that. Looks like we have one more question in the chat, but before we do that, can I acknowledge something? Are you wearing a Von Dutch hat? Yes, I am, brother. What? Are those like, <laughs> those are cool again? Those are just like back? I think, I think so. I think I'll make it look kind of cool. What? So That's <laughs> what a world. I remember back in the day, the Everything first time those came around. around. Right? Everything. <laughs> I know, we're just like, we're so old now that I'm seeing it again. Time is funny like that because we're what 10 years older than you or something you know so it's funny. Like, to that. Um, okay, the question, question is sorry. The, the question is what would you say is the most difficult part of the art making process um, from research to finish? Oh. And it might depend on each project maybe each project's different you know even. Yeah I think it's how to how to take everything you just researched and everything that like, oh, because it does take research, right? But then it takes you and your voice because you don't want to take the research. And it, like, you know how when you're writing a, a paper and it's like, oh, you don't want to plagiarize. It's the same thing in, with art, right? You don't want to plagiarize or do something in somebody else's way, even though it's nothing new under the sun. Everybody is like, we just talked about the head. Everything is coming full circle, right? But I think it's more so execution. I think that's the hardest part. Like, are you really executing on what you you think you're doing? And in that part, I think that's where you need other eyes sometimes. Not necessarily somebody to validate that you're going down the right path, but somebody to come in and, and just for you, like, I like to ask people why a lot. Like when I'm teaching students or I'm talking to somebody, why is a, a question that sometimes we can't answer, but it's like the hardest question. Why do you feel like that? Why did you, why you like that certain color? Why did I buy that plant? Why, right? So I think bringing people inside of your studio, inside of your space sometimes, um, or just inviting other eyes to say, well, why are you doing that? Or even ask them why, right? Um, I like talking to people who don't know nothing about art and say, uh, how you feel about that color? Um, it's making me feel uncomfortable. Why? Why does that blue make you feel uncomfortable? I don't know. I never really, I think it's because, like, I think those are the things that help and, and kind of get you to a place to see if you execute on what you what you're trying to do with your work. So, yeah. I love that. I like I know you did like illustrations for a mental health conference here in Philadelphia. And I was wondering how was that? Because you had to create like uh comic book pages for people to express their emotions. Maybe you could tell us a bit about that and what it took to think about how people might use it. Mm -hmm. Um I, it was a cool experience. Um you know I'm be honest. So in that in that work, uh, I made a, a trans person in that work, and I felt like that was so cool, like because that's something that in the past I, I probably wasn't even thinking about, um, because I'm just I was just thinking about my experience, right? But it's like mental health ain't just me. That's everybody, right? Regardless of what you identify as, whatever you're going through, 
that's everybody. Um, so I, I honestly think that was super cool and just the process of the review process of the design, you know, uh, asking people, well, why do you think that work or why don't you think that work or you should, like I remember I made this one design and the bars was like the American flag, right? And it was broken talking about decriminalizing mental health. Um, and it was like, well, you should move the bar here so that I could poke out a little bit more. Or you should do this hairstyle on this character because it looks like, I think those things are dope because also, like I said, I, I, was, I was using graphic design to help me earn money too. So it's not like I'm so glued to some of the stuff that I create when I'm creating stuff for, uh, like I said, for organizations or like illustrations and stuff like that. You got to be able to have criticism. Uh, whereas when I'm creating this body of work, that's more personal to me. That's that's different between that's that's inside of a gallery. That's inside of somewhere where you guys know my story. There's a bio that someone can go read and all of that stuff. Whereas when I'm doing commissions and stuff like that. Nobody, nobody really knew that I made that unless they asked or somebody shouted me out, you know. But I, I think that stuff is fun, and especially the the design review part. You get to hear what people think, which is cool. Yeah, hopefully that's making you feel better and, and, and not worse, considering you know what we're talking about. But maybe since we're we just have a few minutes left, you can tell us some of the ways that you use self care in order to sort of like fill your mind and your soul. Um. Yeah. So, like, I love um. Music. Music is a big thing about my self-care and like taking walks, um, plant planting and buying plants and stuff like that. That's a part of my self-care. I think that's just as a part, just as important as creating. Um, I think Emilio had posted this thing the other day and it was like, yo, that's so true. Um, he was like, I saw something, I saw something in my work with one night to sleep and then trying to stay in the studio for two nights straight. Um, and I think that's something that was very, very powerful to me because I used to be in a studio with this, you know, hustle mentality, like trying to grind it out, grind it out, where it's like, you're not really taking care of yourself doing it. Sometimes it's okay to go rest. Um, it's okay to go have fun. It's okay to go do what you feel like is rewarding for you, you know? Um, that's just as important as creating a work uh, that goes hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Uh, so. Like I said, music, going on walks, uh, taking care of my plants, and also hanging out with my family. Uh, that's super big to me, um, my family and friends. Uh, and like uh, journaling and checking in with myself. Those are very, very important things uh, to me uh, for my self-care. I think that's really great. And um we're almost at the end of our time. So I definitely want to thank our sponsor, Ray Reed, for allowing us to have these wonderful monthly conversations with change makers. Um, we talked about quite a bit and we've tried to put as many links as possible in the chat for people who want to be able to see that. Uh, I think this is going up on, is it Facebook to be able to view it? YouTube, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Tomorrow, so if anyone missed the show, you want to let them know, or if you missed a part of it, please feel free to go back and uh, and check that out and uh yeah make use of the black paradise project go ahead Conrad. i'm sorry i, was say, I just want to like highlight one thing you said in his ear too the walking thing i really i totally get that as well and over the years i've interviewed a number of artists and i always think about what swoon told me one time which is like as an artist as a creative as a person in this world if you ever get stuck on a project or just stuck in your life just do the next known thing as small as it is i always hold on to that piece of advice and then the walking thing, I even just heard Shonda Rhimes in a recent interview talk about like when you're stuck, when you're not knowing what to do, when you're looking for inspiration or you're just you're just burnt out, go leave your work, go walk around, run errands, do whatever, go to the park, go have drinks with your friends, go into the real world and like live and breathe as a real human person in this world and you'll come back to it and you know, you'll figure it out then. But I, what you said has, I have used that advice as well over the years. Like, you can sit in front of your computer for 12 hours a day and do two things if you're just like not there, if you're not ready to do that work. Um, and sometimes you just need to like release your body a little bit to come back and do that mental work. Cause it is mental, it's mental, it's spiritual, all this work, you know? I love that you it's said a lot. It's so practical, but it was like one of the few things we don't allow ourselves to do or that I can admit that I don't allow myself to do quite often. It's like someone saying that I should like step away for a second just feels like, but I have to do, you know? Um, and yeah, maybe that's like loving myself enough to say that I can allow myself to have 30 minutes to just like, to be, be with myself. 
the work's never going away. The work is always going to be there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's something I've always heard too. It's not going, it's not going to get no legs. It's going to be there when you come back. <laughs> that is a yeah. good thing to think about. Um, but you've got, I mean, you want to close this out kind of like, cause I've been, I've been chatty Kathy. I want to thank Nazir again. I've, I think just being on sort of the outside of your career, like it's been so great to watch you like, you know, have such success more recently, but I'm just a huge fan of your work. And I personally hope we see a mural of your work one day sooner than later, we'll see. Um, we are on a mural arts podcast or whatever this is. Maybe mural arts will <laughs> hear that and answer the Chiron crawl. I'm so bad at metaphors, whatever. Chiron, the siren, the siren. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Um, are you interested in murals? <laughs> yes, I am. It, I, it'll happen, it'll happen. It will, it will. It will. It will. But thank you for your time. Thank you, Ginger, as always, co-host. And we'll be back next month with a new topic, two new guests, and just another great conversation and, and time to gather with community and have fun. Great talking right. to you. All right, you guys. Bye. Thanks for having me. Bye.